because 12 people gets an international response and 2,000 people slaughtered gets virtually no response, right? Right? So if you watch the news and you see 12 people's lives, more important than 2,000 people's lives, and you're located, you're grounded in reality, you don't need to roll up, you don't need to stress out, you know, you don't need to take off work, smack nobody around, you know. Nobody bets a gun to me. No, you, it, no, it's no, we got it. We got it. We can move on. We can actually move toward solutions, common understandings, you know, resolving issues that cause the type of situations that cause the trauma and the stress and the confusion. How about, um, they came for the Jews and they came for me, right? You ever heard that? You know, they came for the communists. I wasn't a communist, you know, so I didn't speak up, you know. And they came for the trade unionist. I wasn't a trade unionist, so, you know, I didn't speak, oh, up. speak up. Then they came for me, and there was nobody that didn't speak for me. So I'm not going to wait till it's my time, and I'm like, oh, everybody should be radical. The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very world, you can see it when you look out your window, or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. When it occurred, so you can't attribute something that happens after the assumed effect to be the cause of it. It's basically common sense, but it's going to play a major role in our dialogue because oftentimes, like we talked about last week with the pull your pants up and then people talked about Dr. King getting shot with a suit on. People will say something that happened after the effect had existed for over 300 years and somehow, cerebral penetration, make that the cause. So, okay, you've been killing me, raping me, and robbing me of everything for 300 years. It's the way you wore your pants in 1985. It's funny, right? Like, it's laughable. But it happens every day. The cause must precede the effect in time. This is just basic rules of causality. So when somebody asks you why this happens, and somebody tells you a proposed reason that occurred after the actual situation or effect was present, it can be discounted mathematically and scientifically. And somebody asks, well, why are they killing each other? So instead of looking at a history of hatred and killing, right? instead of looking at you not having your own ways, taking on someone else's ways and what those ways are, instead of looking at any of that, in Chicago, Illinois, it's that rap music. Like history. Well, Tupac talks about it all the time, right? Like, we're the first ones to bomb and cuss. Right? Tell me how you know it. So, we're going to look at Tupac before fame, before allegations, before money, before movies, right? So, we can strip all that away and possibly see, at least to some degree, because we can't determine causation, but we can determine correlation, right? Like you said, I never had a record till I made a record. So you can't just say, oh, this is why, but there's definitely a correlation between the two. So when we see what Tupac is talking about, the way he expresses himself, when nobody's there, no show, no groupie, no nothing, no TV camera, no critics, in a larger sense, right? So we get the essence of Tupac to a greater extent than we do after his outside influence, after his pressure to sell records. <laughs> propaganda taught to me in class. How can we control our future if we are kept from our past? This is not Dr. King. This is not Malcolm X. This is, this is Tupac Shakur. Right? Sankofa, right? That's what they say in African American studies. The Sankofa bird was reaching behind itself, the symbol. You know, go back and fetch it, right? Can't know your future unless you know... We can't move forward until we look back. 
That's the point. That's what we're going into today. Because instead of just jumping in at 19, I don't know, 71 or 2 or whatever the case may be, or even 1965, let's talk about this whole thing so that we can get a better understanding of what's what. I picked this scene. I don't know if people know what that's from. Jews, right? Because I remember the time he said, Top of the world, Ma! Top of the world! James Cagney. If you gotta go out, that's how you go out. That took his destiny in his own hands. Destiny in future. <laughs> Some destiny. What you know about a big child? What you ever control? I'll control my fucking okay, so. um, <laughs> Similar statement, you know, different, different individual, right? Of all our studies, history is best qualified to reward our research. Apes. Who knows the movie Planet of the Apes? That is beautiful. The original? Right. Okay, not Mark Wahlberg, you know, right. four punch of people behind all that. I'm talking about, you know, Charlton Heston, right? right? Planet of the Apes. In short, Planet of the Apes, humans on the ape planet, the apes are running things. I'll play the trailer, no need to belabor the point, and then we'll talk a little more. Somewhere in the universe, there has to be something better than man. Has to be. Has to be. The words are Charlton Heston. Get out of line, signal! Your words, and we've landed! The world he finds out in the galaxy will challenge every idea you've ever had of civilization. A planet where man is the lowest order of living thing, and the superior beings are apes. They build the cities, make the laws, the gods, and control the guns that hunt a race of lonely, terrified humans who run wild in the jungles, are caged in the prisons, and stuffed in the museum. Who's familiar with uh, Sarah Bartman? You sort of see he's just stuffed in yes. the museums, right? Yes. Right. So, this is the end of the movie. Long story short, Apes been saying, you savages in the jungle deserve to be locked up. You know, we're the only civilized ones. We help civilize you. And this is the final scene. Really did it. You maniacs! You blew it up! And the movie ends just like that. That's the end of the movie. That's it. And credits, right? So the whole time you watching this movie thinking they on this alien ape planet. I mean, for the whole two plus hours, you just swearing that they are on this, this ape planet, this crazy planet. And then what do you learn at the end? Now, let's ask a question. Let's see. Let's see. Not that question, couldn't be. Let's ask a question. What is the oldest book you know of? Huh? We got one for Bible. What else? What's the oldest book? First book. Because we in school... First book. We're in school, right? So, of course, we know about books. No matter what your major, we should have a basic understanding of books. And I think one basic question that we should have an answer to, like if somebody says, how much that college cost? You say, oh, about 30000 a year. So I say, yeah, I've been reading it. What's the first book? You know, you know you're paying all that money. I, mean, I know you know. You, know, you go to Temple. You know, we the team, man. The Temple's still the smart. Yes, sir? Uh, isn't Beowulf older than the Bible? Somebody said Beowulf. We got Beowulf. Like, like uh... Right. Price is right. Price is right. Right? Got five dollars. Anybody want to go one dollar? Yes. Um, I feel like one of the books in the Book of the Dead from like the ancient Egyptian. Book of the right. Dead, maybe. Right. Okay. Okay. Where are we at? Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. I hear that often. Mm-hmm. Anybody heard of Ptahhotep? Yes. The wisdom of Ptahhotep. Just, yes. just briefly. This will be moving, right? Okay. We're trying to get Authors date the maxims of Ptahhotep originated much earlier than the 25th century. Right. The maxims of Ptahhotep. Believed to be the first book in history by many scholars, right? And the book's talking about Ma'at. Anybody heard about Ma'at? Yes. Symbol of truth, justice, harmony. Like Warren Hill says, reciprocity, right? Uh, the weighing of the heart, right? So again, we have a, a feather, right? This is the Papyrus of Ani from the Book of the Dead, also known as the Book of Coming Forth by Day. We have Amnit, right? And we have Jehudi, also known as Thoth later, changed right. by the Greeks, right? And we have our jury, right? Right? Don't get right. it twisted. We got our scales of justice. It's called the weighing of the heart. It's one of the most popular pages, most cited pages in the text. The weighing of the heart. So this is the heart, right? Right here, right? 
and that's the feather. And if your if your heart is not weighed down by sin and it is light as or lighter than the feather, then you are able to proceed through the afterworld, and your heart is not eaten <coughs> by amnet. And this is the scribe writing stuff down. So when people tell you the first book is Gilgamesh, right? Let's do pop first. Excuse me, but Lady Liberty needs glasses, and so does Miss Justice by her side. Both in broads are blind as bats, stumbling through the system justice. Tupac and Lady Liberty's glasses will probably be there later. So the interesting part about the previous slide, take a note at how closely and intently people are watching this take place, you know. Mm -hmm. got a stenographer here, you know. Mm -hmm. We checking this out. We got, you know, yeah, this is, you know. You know, some people say I can throw it on a scale, I don't even need to wait, you know. But they are doing the young Jeezy type thing. They're doing something a little different. <laughs> you got to keep it You know, some, you know, everybody can't catch them all. So, the heart is being weighed, right? Everybody's intent on really seeing what is taking place. And then we move on here. No wonder we got this problem. She need a peek, man, come on. Maybe she can hear the name. They say Leroy Jackson? You know, maybe she's not. Okay, who's this guy right here? Who's this guy? Who's this guy? <laughs> yeah. Who doesn't know him? I mean, it's okay. Like, you know, just talk to him. Hey, it's not Joey Molino. It's not, it's not to you. All right? Who doesn't know? Who doesn't know? Okay. Chairman of the African American Studies Department at Temple University. Responsible for the first PhD program in African American Studies in the entire world. And where was that done? Temple University, right? I am the Memphis Bleak to his Jigga, the Eric Holder, to his Obama. I am one hit away, and I am fast and furious. I'm just joking. But, um, <laughs> this is Dr. Asante, right? So Dr. Asante popularized the concept of Afrocentricity. We talked about that last class, about being located in a specific cultural context. So if you're Asian, you have an Asian context and a worldview and a history. You have art, you have literature, you have an understanding of customs and spirituality, spiritual systems, and you have a way of looking at the world that enhances the educational lived experience when people come together on equal terms and respect each other's diversity or opinion and perspective. Yeah. Right? So it's supposed to make it better. Like the diversity is not, like my man Bill O'Reilly would say, not to water down the homogeny, right? The diversity is supposed to be able to say, okay, we got somebody in the class from Japan, we got somebody in the class from London, we got somebody in the class who's famous from the Caribbean, we got somebody in the class, like that. You can bring that perspective to the conversation and the dialogue and the information is enriched in a way that people benefit more than they would if everybody just pretended to be like one or two people in the class. Afrocentricity is a paradigm based on the idea that African people should reassert a sense of agency in order to achieve sanity. And this is where we get this we got we gotta talk out now. Cause um Tupac was stressed on a lot of his songs, right? Before Little Wayne. He was smoking in the booth. That's his cigarette dog. They got me feeling crazy to move, right? Crazy, right? Time goes by, puffing on live, hoping that it gets me high. Right? Illuminati's got their theory, got crazy with him and badass, right? Said I'm losing my mind, losing my mind. You know the song losing it. Mm -hmm. And this I just put I'm going crazy because he said this in so many songs, mm -hmm. I couldn't, you know. Just pick the first ten that came up, but you're going crazy. You're going crazy. You're going crazy. Like he just kept saying he's crazy, going crazy, going crazy. Right? He's stressed. He's crazy. He's crazy. He's stressed. Okay. Afrocentricity, the paradigm based on the idea that African people should be a sense of agency. The why is the important part. In order to achieve sanity, because if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going, right. and you see how Lady Justice with them blindfolds, you know why that's so important and what the problem is. And you'll get an understanding of why it was such a revolutionary idea to have Afrocentricity for African American Studies. The only department in the university that people were arrested and sat in and bled and had to fight and petition to become a legitimate part of the university. Everybody else, it's a given. Oh, you want to teach that? Cool. Whatever it is. Asian Studies, Women's Studies, Queer Studies. It's all good. Come on in. African American Studies, way outside. Right? Had to sit in, take over buildings, right? All that. All that. So let's hear Dr. Sani talk about Apple-centricity and Propaganda and reality. What people say, like what they write, and what they do. It was necessary for Europeans in the United States, and even those in Europe, to attack Africa at the very core in order to advance a curriculum of European supremacy. Else, neither enslavement nor colonialism was possible, were possible. 
But we have been the negation in the United States, the black population has been the negation to the negation of our history. And so we have overturned the comfort of the racist by questioning their morality and their facts. This has been the long struggle. I wrote a book uh, some years ago, 10 years or more, called uh, The uh, uh, African American History, uh, a, An Odyssey or a Quest for Liberation, which has been, of course, the principal myth of the African population in the United States. On the other hand, Africa, the continent, and the nations in it, represents the original home of the human species. Africa is where Homo sapiens learn the elementary responses to each other and to the environment. And humans lived in Africa for two-thirds of the time that Homo sapiens have been in existence. It is easy to say that Africa is not only the home of the mother and father of humanity, but the home of the mother and father of civilization. The oldest math calculators found in the world are found in the Lubombo bone in Swaziland. 28,000 years ago, the Africans began to mark uh, the period of women. In Congo, the Isonge bone, 20,000 years ago, represent the second of the oldest mathematical calculators that we have in human history. So, this is to set the tone for this discussion, which I hope to uh, cover many aspects of uh, the trouble with understanding Africa, because by virtue of Europe's engagement with Africa at a very negative level, it has also impacted and affected people throughout the world, even in Asia. I see the same uh, experience, that is the experience of, of Europe having colored the minds of Asians regarding Africa. This is why, for example, a gentleman gave me the other day, two days ago, uh, a list of religions uh, in the world, and there was no African religion listed. And that is because simply one assumes that there are no African religions. And we assume that by virtue of the white, racist, supremacist attitude that was launched against Africa at the very beginning to assault and attack the humanity of African people. Otherwise, this notion of the enslavement of Africans would have created many psychological problems. In fact, it did and still does. The main trope of the imperialist and European supremacist was colonization of information, not just simply the colonization of people and territory, but of information about that territory. Africa, in order to establish a proper curriculum, must resist this tendency uh, even more now that our curriculum uh, when you look at the curriculum at all of the universities, you see the same imitation, the same repetition of Europe. So that uh, it is rare, and I've lived in Africa, traveled throughout the continent, trained the first journalist after the Chimaranga in Zimbabwe, and yet I have never seen an African university in Africa. And I'm sure you have Asian universities in Asia, but we don't have African universities in Africa. We have imitation European universities. And almost all of the ones that are considered great and good are basically copies of European universities. So the, the issue with the curriculum in an African university must be one that starts at the beginning. We may have to reconstruct entire universities. And we can do this, but we have to have the will to do it. And we must know what we are doing. Let me just tell you where we must start. We must start with chronology. That is essential. We must start with chronology in African universities. We must understand that Nubia and Kemet are to Africa 
as China and India are to Asia and Greece and Rome are to Europe. You have to start there. If you do not start in an African university with Kemet, which is the African name for Egypt, Egypt is the Greek name for the land, if you do not start with Kemet and Nubi, you cannot start properly with an African curriculum. It does not exist. Because what we find in Africa is that most of the universities start in Greece. But this is problematic. 2,500 years before this era, 2,500 years before this era, the Africans had completed the building of the pyramids. 2,500 years before this era, that's like almost 5,000 years ago, the pyramids were up. In 2,500 B.C., if you use that designation, there was no Greece. It didn't exist. 2,500 before this era, there was no Rome. It did not exist. So why would an African university start its curriculum from the Greeks? You know, you think the Africans were waiting around for the Greeks before they built the pyramids? You know, people were waiting and said, you know, the Greeks are not here yet. We can't do anything. We have to wait till they come, and when they come, they will give us some wisdom and knowledge and teach us geometry. No, that is not the story. The story has to be that at the very beginning of the history of the African civilizations, African people on that continent itself have already, by 2500 B.C., Finish the last of the Great Pyramids. They're up. Started around 2900 BC, but by 2500 they're finished. There's no, no Greece. There's a Chinese dynasty of the Shia. There's Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. There's Nubia. There's no Greece. It does not appear. It appears in 1000 B.C. when we hear the first voice of intelligence from the Greece, Greece. and that's Homer. Thank you. So he said um, two-thirds of human history existed on the continent of Africa, Homo sapiens, and we got one-third everywhere else, right? Two-thirds, and we got one-third, right? We got three parts here. So the epitome of academic and intellectual criminality and arrogance is to say, skip those first two-thirds, we're going to start right here. To ignore the majority of existing human history and say, nah, I wasn't there for that. <laughs> we'll start right here. Keep the party going. There really is. And, and people talk about, um, I know a hashtag about being Columbus, you know, Columbus and things, I just take the things over. Mm -hmm. It's this Columbus worldview where it's like things start, you know. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, Houdini, you might not have heard of that old rap from Dave Houdini. Yeah. Say party and start till I walked in. Right? So, you know, when I get there, you know, right. now, now you know, now we can do this. Now turn it up, DJ. I'm here. You know, shout me out. You know, now we can get this thing started. But before that, everybody was just, you know, miserable on the wall, you know, the drinks tasted different. But once I got there, you know, boom. They called me Chris, CC me, Columbus in the house, baby. You know, write that down. You know, we're gonna make that the beginning. It's the first track right there, it's my intro. So the issue is that you don't really benefit people by lying to them, right? Make the delineation that it's you know kind of insane to try to determine a degree of melanin to which you will not like hang around, eat with, sit next to, and marry someone. That's a that's an insane concept. Not so insane in the insane world we exist in, because we know there's very real rules, consequences, and historically there's been laws that codify such insanity. So we've got to balance the two. Race is not a zero-sum game. Any sports fans, what's a zero-sum game? A zero-sum game means zero over here and some over there. There's a winner and a loser. There's no ties. There's no shared victories. You know, like that, that thing where... 
Juan Carlos did the, the you know, there's the first and there's the other people, right? Only one podium for me to stand on, right? Everybody else got to, you know, like be honest, bow down, bow down, right? Zero sum game is if I win, you lose, right? And it's been taught that race is a zero sum game. Somebody has to lose. They're going to take our jobs. They're the border. Oh my God. Because <laughs> if they improve their standard of life, it must mean mine decreases. That's what I've been taught since Bacon's Rebellion. That's what I've been taught since the slave world. Man, they're going to come and they're coming. They're coming. The British are coming. Everybody's coming. Everybody's coming. Right? The slaves are going to run free. Oh, the Mexicans are coming on the border. Right? All day, right? 300 years of fear. That's victimization. You better not leave me. Don't nobody else wants you. What's the color purple? You're fat, yo, you're black, you're a woman, you're ugly, right? Everything you do, right? Nothing like that will keep me from it. But yeah, okay, I'm back. But seriously, you see that that in, in abuse in cinema and in real life. I'm going to make you fearful of being alone. I'll make you fearful of being without me. I'll make you fearful to tell what I'm doing to you. I'll make you fearful to just be who you are so you look in the mirror and hate yourself and blame yourself for everything that happens to you. Oh, man, you just mentally just, just fooling yourself all day living in the dream world. You know that's not the case, but it feels good, don't it? So those people are victimized as well. So when you're convinced, girl, you got a you got a privilege. I didn't kill 20 people to buy you that for a coat, but you in the mirror like this. <laughs> I'm better than them. At least I'm better than them. Right? That's a victim. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not like, oh, I won. No, you victimize as well. You're a victim of fear, a victim of ignorance. You're a victim of, of, of thinking that somebody else's quality of life has to adversely affect or even impact yours directly in any way. As opposed to, you know, like Mandy said, you know, quoting, you know, previous brother, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Right? That's a different way of thinking. Let's all do better. It'll be better for everybody. Because very few people with a $40,000 a year job are out bugging people, hitting them in the face with bricks, you know, and doing things like that, right? Or with good schools, right? Those people, you don't really see those kind of crimes typically. Not that it doesn't happen, there's always anomalies and exceptions to every rule. And we're going to make sure we delineate between the two, right? What do we delineate between? Exceptions and rules. Oftentimes you're going to see different debates and people make comments, and people are going to take the exception and try to thrust it into the conversation as though that's the way it is. Say, what about that case? Like billions of people in the world. I mean, you talking about this one dude as an example of music or musical genre, as an example of a race of people. Like example. But it's not a zero-sum game. Race is not a zero-sum game. But racism is. Race is not a zero-sum game, but racism is. Racism is winners and losers. Racism is, oh, I'm going to treat you so nice, you guys can sit right here, I'm going to keep them outside. Victims. Victims. Can't meet people, can't learn about people, keep you ignorant, then I got to scare you. You say, why not? Why not? Well, don't you know what they'll do if they come in here? I'm gaming you. You might as well stay with me, your family don't want you to go back, girl, you're going to make that money. <laughs> Had it been calling? Color purple with all the letters, right? This little color purple, right? She found all the letters, right? The whole time, what they saying? No, no, nobody think about her. Nobody asked about her. She checking the mailbox. She checking the mail. Nobody wants you. If she do come here, it'd probably be to sell you or do something bad to you. You don't want them coming here, sitting next to you. You don't want them in this part of this bus. I guess not, Master. I guess not. Now you nervous, smiling every time you see him because you filled up with a lie. You don't even know nobody. That's a victim. So race is not a zero-sum game, but racism is a zero-sum game. And we ignore two-thirds of human history for the benefit of maintaining illusion so we can go do some dirt, right? I took you from the jungle. was nothing over there. So like Soldier Boy said when he thanked the slave masters, be happy. Don't worry. Like Bobby McFerrin said, be happy. So if you start from slavery and you, you know, I would like you slide right with you when Obama get elected, but it's a different context. I'm thinking, you know, we're on our way back up. Not. That's the best way I've ever had it. You know, different. Different way of viewing the world, right? You know, back to roles of leadership. Like, we have a two-thirds of human history. That's a good sign. Everybody gets a chance, you know, to have leadership roles. You know, more perfect union. That's different than 
hey, people are making a lot of progress. Not really, not in comparison, not relatively to the dynasty, but I mean, one job is good for one brother, you know? He hired a couple more, well, I don't know, you know? But if you start from the middle, everybody's victimized. Everybody's saying Gilgamesh. So you just like, Nefertari, Nefertari, Akhenaten, King Tut, Tutankhamen, like, no. Well, it's called papyrus, right? Papyrus? I mean, people say, well, what do you do with papyrus, right? It's paper, right? So paper was, was invented in Europe? Is that what we're trying to say now? So you tell me they had paper, but they didn't do nothing with it. <laughs> do you see the insanity? Do you see the insanity? They'll admit that the paper was, was in here. They'll show you some feather pens. But they were not right nothing. Black. And they said, well, I took crit. So we got there. Then they started. I told them what to do with it. Right? Like the Asians had gunpowder, fireworks, and but we got it. <laughs> Let me stop. Um, this is the Planet Ace experience that the people get when they try to move away from it. Because I'm, I'm located. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm Greece. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Socrates. I'm Plato. Like Dr. Sonny said, there's a Greek every corner. You want, you, want, you, know, you want philosophy, you want politics, you want, you know, you want medicine, you, you know, faculty. You, you get a Greek every corner, I get a Greek, right? What you want, what you need. Like the guy in the corner with three cards, right? You're going to lose every time, right? What you want, what you want. You want fake leaves, you want that, you want, you want, you want. That is what you need, right? Don't put your money down there, right? So, once I see this stuff, once I see this, my gosh, how do I explain this? This is me, this is, this is, this is how I explain it. This is me. This is my experience. This is me when I first found out what Dr. Sutton was talking about. This is exactly what I did. He and all was there. But the books were. That's me. That's me coming home with my first lecture. Here, it takes me back. It takes me back. Woo! Gotta bring it back. I was like, yo, I was, but did, did, didn't Charles Heston do the same thing? Yes. Didn't Charles Heston do the same thing? Yes. Damn you all the hell, right? <laughs> you lied to me my whole time, man, the whole time. What kind of say when that Truman boat, when that, you know, hit, the Truman Show boat hits, hits that, come on, man, it's, it's, come on. Everything collapsed. The history. And this, is, this, and this is the problem. This is the problem. Who played, who played Jenga? Jenga is the game with the wooden blocks, all the square yeah, wooden yeah, blocks, yeah. when you take the blocks, right? Yeah, right, right. Racism is a game of Jenga. Because if you pull the wrong darn block, Everything this is the Truman Show boat. Once you say something like, wait, wait, if paper was in, who been in a relationship where they told a lie? I love that question. Like that. For the one or two people that have a friend that did. <laughs> I lied. I lied. I lied. And um, I know the rule for lying. There's a rule for lying. I'm going to tell you the rule. Not you going to use it. Maybe you can spot a liar. The rule for lying is once you tell a lie, what do you need to do? Keep on. Stick to your story, man. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Right. Anybody had a joke where said, you know, the girl catches you, said, well, you know, a shaggy song. That joke wasn't me. Right? He said, but I saw you. It was you. I saw your car. It wasn't me. But you was in your truck. I saw it. I'm with you. It wasn't me. You don't deviate. You was in the jungle. You wasn't writing nothing. But what about the pattern? But jungle. But jungle. But I heard 230. You were here. Jungle. <laughs> but your own scientists said that life started though. Know, how can you argue you put Adam and Eve in the lake and look like they from Germany? Well, jungle. What do you mean? <laughs> Gotta stick to it, man. Got you like the Wizard of Oz. Once they saw the dude was a midget talking in a megaphone karaoke right, machine, right, right, right. the whole Wizard of Oz thing was, to, you know, right. this is a joke. No. And, and with the thought of the zero sum game mentality. Because people think it's zero sum games. So people are like, yo, it's a lie. But if we tell the truth, right? I heard a lady say in one, one interview, said, if um, Obama gets elected, would she put white people in slavery? Because when people view the world, they view the world, winners, lose, winners, lose. Mm -hmm. Not, let's work this out. Mm -hmm. Big part, um, Baby's Rebellion, right? I talk about that often. Baby's Rebellion, when the serfs, then serf to type level, poor whites, right, got together with the enslaved and newly freed Africans, mm -hmm. 
And he said, um, guess what? We're all being screwed. Nobody's doing good. And you know what? I think that this exploitation of this whole race thing is part of the screwing. I think they're using that. I think the reason why they make me scared of you and vice versa is because they're sitting there, like I talked about last class, with the pie. So they're like, yo, you better watch those black, you know. Hey, you working? Work on, I'll give you the job. I won't give him the, I'll give you the job. But he didn't work, he didn't work, right? So at, uh, at some point, like the Bacon Rebellion, right, they were like, yo, let's just go grab the pie. We can stop fighting. You ain't got to work so hard. You ain't got to beat me. I ain't got to work. Let, the pie is in there, right? After that, what they do? They codify race, and that's, you know, they said, yo, we got to split this thing up, different crimes, you know, all that, all that, you know, color of law. So there's moments where people kind of catch on a little bit, and then they're like, you know, Chill with that in their assessment. If you're the 1% and you have 98% of the world's wealth, then for you that is a legitimate, realistic way to view the world. Your coming up does hurt my standard of living. I got to share. But that only applies to such a small percentage of people. So those, that percentage of people being able to convince everybody else that's the way the world is, you know, that's the greatest trick to develop. I mean, you know, that's, that's the greatest trick. So here's me, right? I do all the punching and I get the books, right? I do all these books. I see the Washington Monument, you know. Right. In Egypt, right? They say there's more Tekkens in Europe that they took out of Egypt than there are still in Egypt, right? Tekken, the American game, right? More Tekkens, as you call it, the obelisk. And I'm like, yo, this is Planet of the Apes. That, that's my Statue of Liberty. I saw that. I'm like, damn, go hell, man. Because you had me on a trip in D.C., you know. You could have told me. You saw I was acting up. You saw I was stressed about something. Not knowing myself, you told me I was going to jump and wonder why I'm jumping around. Okay, right? However, there is something that could settle this debate of where the Chinese come from once and for all. I'm meeting Professor Jim Lee, one of China's leading geneticists. Recently, he led a project that set out to prove that the Chinese evolved independently from everyone else, from Homo erectus, here in China. Do you know what that theory is? The people evolved? It's a right. polygenetic theory. Yeah. Polygenetic theory means people just popped up. Somebody just popped up, you know, and popped up black, you know, and then the Russell somebody popped up white, and everybody just popped up. But we saw the slide before that, so, you know, it's not what happened. Yeah, so let me see if we actually... Over 160 ethnic groups around East Asia. Over 12,000 samples. So they did their research, basically. Let's see what they found. And so, what did you find? We did not see. Any, even one single individual that would, could be considered as the descendant of the Homo erectus in China, rather than everybody, was a descendant of our ancestors from Africa. The result couldn't be anything. After I saw the evidence. Hold up, be my man's response though, he's dying. I think we should all be happy with that because, after all, modern humans from different parts of, part of the world are not so different from each other, and we are very close relatives. Wouldn't find that response in America, huh? Mm -hmm. He would have dropped dead. <laughs> he would have got that news, and he would have dropped dead. And that's what people say about Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton was saying black power for black people, white power for white people, yellow power for yellow people, red power. That's the Bacon's Rebellion thing. You know, you didn't cross the line like that. That wasn't the plan. The plan was for you to still be polarized and marginalized, at least be divided in your seat in your quest for power. Because collective power challenges the collective power. Uh, you get it. Right? Now it's virtual state in Europe, apparently, would not be recognizable as ethnically Caucasian whatsoever. Right? It's only a problem if you're racist. That's like somebody saying the because it's used as dominant group. We have dominant group conversation. Science also says that all these people can be traced back to a woman in Africa. That's right. Not to offend anybody's spiritual sensibilities, but the science today says a woman. So unless you're a sexist, then okay, I came from a woman too. It's not that deep. Right. It's the way things kind of work. Kind of makes sense when you think about it, right? right. So, so let, me, let, me, let me get some Margaret White brothers up in here. You know, so we can, we can Rango Coalition this thing right on up, right? This dude's seen the space, right? He got some 1798 talking. He said, there was proportional colossal, a little racism in it, but you know, at least he's honest about something. 
The outline is pure and graceful, the expression of the head is mild, graceful, and tranquil. The character is African. But the mouth and the lips, of which are thick, as a softness and delicacy. Oh, he's doing too much. But, um. Let me tell you something. Pause. Pause. <laughs> check it out. Check it out. But I'm saying, the dude that's there is like, this is what I see. Somebody that comes a hundred years later is like, damn, no, man. It happens all the time. It happens with, with Darwinism versus social Darwinism. This is what Darwin meant. No, Darwin said what he meant. The racist part and the part that wasn't racist. It's clear. There's no need for you to come and remix what Darwin said. But people do all the time, right? In other words, this is uh, Constantine de Valais, right? Born in 1757. This is my man. He got the baby hair, like the uh, 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 <laughs> baby hair pumping, right? He might have a drop in him. He might have a drop. Well, how is his hair staying like that? Let me ask him who his grandmother is. Okay. In other words, these <laughs> Egyptians, Egypt is in Africa, right? He got that. Were true Negroes of the same type as all native born Africans, right? So he says, just think, if only declared incredulously, that this race of black men today, our slave and object of our scorn, is the very race to which we are art, science, and even the use of speech. Right? So this moment, so it's not. It's not an issue of being against race, it's an issue of being against racism. Because a lot of people of every color were like, no, this is stupid. Like, give me John Brown any day over Clarence Thomas to make a play. You know, like, starting with Ahotep I, who drove out the foreign occupiers, and her daughter Amos Nefertari, shown here. Then there's Hatshepsut, the most stunning exception to the rule of male pharaohs. So look, so from King Tut to King what? So I went to the exhibit, and I saw all these pictures of King Tut, I got to the end, and they showed me that Prince Charles, and I almost had a Cuba Good moment, but you know, but I said, No, they showed you a bunch of black pictures of people, yeah. then they get to the end and give you Prince Charles right. with a Caesar. I don't know. So, <laughs> so here we go again. We play games, we play games. We got, we, we, we got, we got the, the doorman, he's a doorman and a musician, and they got the white people in Africa, and I'm like, there's no reason, there's no reason, like, it's, it's okay, whether they're brown, white, it doesn't matter, right? But it seems to matter because the people that are obviously black, you're making them black, right? So we got an issue with that. So we're here with Queen T, and that's two of y'all right there. That's what she's playing. That's what she's playing. See the weave and all that stuff going on, right? <laughs> sister got that North Philly, right? <laughs> so boy, the weaver got the weaver, that's the name. Weaver, it was destiny. Weave. It's all in the name. It's all in the name. So Tupac describes his mother and compares her in the movie to Harry Tubman, right? Remember that? It's like Harry Tubman. So that's historical context, and it just goes to show, same way we talk about this whole conversation, it depends on what your, your, your location is, what you think is good, what you think is good treatment, what, what do you, what do you, how do you view yourself in history and in the world? That's the whole point. Don Henry Clark said that history is a compass. That's how we understand ourselves in the world. Like, that's why people talk about, you know, your grandmother was a Jew, your grandfather was a Jew. Well, yeah. People always give that to children so they can have an understanding of their ability and potential to achieve and their, their rightful place as, as leaders and contributors to society. Like, that's the whole point. So once you, and the whole point was to take that. Like, the whole slave breaking process is a generational process. Not like, so what boxing, right? I know they like to beat you down a lot, right? And he asked, since we all came for a woman, got a name for a woman, and our game for a woman, what do we take for our women? What we rape our women? Do we hate our women? Now, I have an issue with anybody who claims to be feminist, but they don't study the things I was just showing you. Why not study that? Your racism trumps your feminism? Show me when the women ran the whole thing and how well it was run. Show me that. That's like people saying they want to help inner city kids, but they don't want to study Elijah Muhammad because he offended them. You're not going to study the guy who was getting people out of jail and off drugs and having them with you. You're not going to study him. You can't take anything good from his program. You know, it, it, it seems disingenuous. So now we're here. Because we're crazy. Because we don't see my eye. We don't see, you know, the women who are supposed to see him, right? Because we're hiding that. We do, we're doing it with, hey, we hide. We're supposed to be hiding that. And then we're putting up the lie all day. This is Evelyn after Ocho Cinco, right? It's a regular woman because regular people are the main ones getting abused. And of course we got Rihanna right there. This happens like every couple seconds of every day around, around the United States, right? Sure, correct. So somebody would say, yo, there's an epidemic. There's a problem. We need to get the truth. No. There is an epidemic. There is a problem, but not quite big enough to pull that block. Because this is Jenga, and I'm on top of it. We'll suspend Ray Rice for a couple. Can't really address the issue, right? Because we don't see him like this. We don't see him like this. Oh, look, my right there. She got the, 
yeah, that's um, Misty Copeland, the ballerina. Oh, that's Ava right. Duvernay, yes. the director of Selma. Yes. You know, so th this this imagery and this this connectivity is a big, big, big deal, big deal. How you see yourself in the world? What's your historical context? What are you supposed to be doing with yourself? Should somebody need to have lethal force at their hip to make you behave yourself? Is that the society you exist in? I need to be walking around with a gun threatening you with death for you to not do what you should be doing anyway. Because your society isn't built on balance and justice and truth and harmony and reciprocity. So I'm going to go out and behave myself because I respect myself. Because I am myself and I know that person. Right? Big difference, right? Now, the person who is in a situation that realizes that but can't quite figure out what to do about it. Let's, just, well, let's, do, let's do verse 2. We're going to end this. He's going to talk about women too. <laughs>